Well, right. So during the 1970s, both the Italian film industry and the American popular cinema, they went nuts with the cop genre. They made so many police movies, and sure, many of them became absolute classics. But by the end of the decade, the genre showed signs of uh, slowing down, of running out of steam. So in the early 1980s, the cop movies had to find a new lease on life in order to reinvent itself and stay fresh. The Italians found that next chapter by shifting the cop movie to the arena of spoofs, of parodies. They lampooned the cop formula, making a bunch of silly comedies. But American cop films went a totally different direction. In the early 80s, the filmmakers really pumped the genre full of sex and sleaze, exploring different sexual underbellies of society, exploring different fetish subcultures. These cop movies didn't just have sex in them, they were about sex. And they didn't mind being downright trashy, especially compared to the prestige cop movies that came in the previous decade. <laughs> Now, how do we know that this was the dominant form of the American cop movie in the early 1980s? Well, all the biggest stars in the genre made such a film. Two of the biggest action stars, Charles Bronson and Clint Eastwood, they each made one. That's right, Clint Eastwood covered himself in baby oil and did tightrope. And Bronson picked up an electrical jack-off device and did 10 to midnight. And the influential director of The French Connection, William Friedkin, he made one, one called Cruising. And if we expand this cop sleaze subgenre to the late 1980s, Bronson actually made two because Kinjite Forbidden Subjects, that certainly counts. Now, were there sex themed cop movies back in the 1970s? Sure, but they were in the realm of the adult film. They weren't part of the mainstream cinema. Back then, you had softcore and X rated movies like Dirty O'Neill, The Love Life of a Cop, Climax of Blue Power, A Scream in the Streets. The Hang Up, and The Massage Parlor Murders. But if I had to grandfather in one mainstream 1970s cop movie into this 1980s cop sleaze movement, it would be Stone Cold Dead. That sort of set the formula. And the formula is a bunch of sex workers are always getting killed, hookers in the case of Stone Cold Dead. And that always means a vice or a homicide detective has to investigate inevitably plunging that cop into a particular sex industry or a sexual subculture. But Stone Cold Dead doesn't get all that tawdry. No, almost as if waiting for the symbolic rollover of the decades, they left that bit of boundary pushing to the first such movie of the 1980s, which immediately turned the sexual content up to 11. Yeah, in William Friedkin's Cruising from 1980, when you see a guy getting rectally fisted off camera, you realize that the cop genre has taken an abrupt turn. The film's story concerns a mystery killer bumping off men who frequent New York's gay leather bar scene, and it concerns a cop, a cop played by Al Pacino, who investigates. The major novelty isn't so much that it's set against a gay sex subculture instead of a straight sex subculture, no, the major novelty to the formula is that the cop in this doesn't carry a gun or a badge. He's deep cover, totally immersed in the lifestyle. And that, in turn, immerses the viewer. That's a very smart move on the story's part. You spend a lot less time hearing procedural cop stuff in precincts, and a lot more time learning about all the theme nights and leather bars, and learning all the intricacies of the hanky code system. Now, cruising is two things. It's mysterious, and authentic. As for being mysterious, the killer is played by different actors in all the film's murder set pieces just to keep the viewer a little off balance. And also the movie finishes on an open-ended note that throws everything into question. Nothing is neat and tidy. As for being authentic, the film was not only based on the 1970 book Cruising by a New York Times reporter, it was also based on the real-life undercover work of Randy Jurgensen with whom director Friedkin previously worked on The French Connection. So Jurgensen gets a role in the movie too, just for added authenticity. And the movie's leather bar scenes were filled out by real New Yorkers who actually practiced that S&M lifestyle. 
but their participation, that didn't keep protests from popping up during the shoot from others in New York's gay community. Now, they thought the film would portray homosexuality as violent and extreme. Now, Cruising was released in 1980 by United Artists, and the next movie in this subgenre was released two years later in 1982 by a second-tier studio, what we now call a mini-major, called Avco Embassy. That movie was entitled Vice Squad. See, the mini majors is where the 80s cop sleaze movement lived most comfortably. Just to show you what I mean, 20th Century Fox started a movie called Fear City by director Abel Ferrara. But Fox found the movie too sleazy and they ended up selling it to a smaller company to let that company release it. I almost included Fear City in this list because it basically fits the formula, but the cop role played by Billy D. Williams isn't the lead, so it didn't feel like a cop film, strictly speaking. Okay, but back to Vice Squad. In this film, a vice cop is trying to find a pimp named Ramrod, who is beating and killing prostitutes, sometimes with a so-called pimp stick. The vice cop enlists the help of a hooker, a sympathetic one who is using her hooking income in order to build a life with her kid. Uh, he enlists his hooker to become an operative for him as he attempts to bust Ramrod. The prostitute is played by Susan Hubley, and she was cast because she had done a similar role for Columbia Pictures' Hardcore several years prior. But the role of Ramrod, that was a total transformation for its actor, Wings Hauser, who previously had enjoyed a nice guy image from a soap opera character he had been playing. Uh, now Wings Hauser and his maniacally over-the-top performance, that's one of the reasons fans love this film. I think the other reason is the great depiction of Los Angeles Skid Row street life in the early 1980s, what the film's opening song calls the Neon Slime. And it also gives a glimpse into street walking as we encounter almost every kind of fetish, golden showers, toe sucking, even a wedding dress fetish. It is a grimy film that very much belongs in the 80s cop sleaze genre, but there's surprisingly little nudity for a film like this. Perhaps it's because director Gary Sherman says he wanted to make a movie about the exploitation of women without actually exploiting women. In feature films, Sherman has mainly directed horror films, and Vice Squad was his first project away from that genre, but he was in experienced hands because the cast hung out with real cops and pimps, and some LAPD officers played bit parts in the film. And same as with Cruising, the guys outside the leather bar, they were the real deal. Now the third film in this subgenre is the Charles Bronson vehicle, Ten to Midnight from 1983. And it has two novelties for the formula. One, the killer isn't killing sex workers and he's not killing anyone in a sexual subculture. No, he's killing nurses and women from his office. The second novelty is that the killer does his killing naked, nude, and that really amps up the sleaze, making the whole thing feel tremendously sexual. Of course, it could also present a problem for when the movie might be broadcast on television later, but reportedly, alternate versions of the murder set pieces were shot for television, with the killer wearing briefs. But nudity wasn't the only thing that made this film tawdry. Everything about the killer's life revolved around sex, on down to his household appliances. The killer was played by Gene Davis, uh, who had already played a cross-dresser in Cruising, basically making him the superstar of this subgenre. But the film actually didn't begin as an attempt to jump onto the cop sleaze bandwagon. The project was actually pre-sold at the 1982 edition of Cannes using only three things. The title, the involvement of Bronson, and a piece of advanced artwork. No script. Now the advanced art characterized the story as an international thriller about terrorism, but once the film was actually sold, they needed a screenplay, and an unrelated script by screenwriter William Roberts was available. Now Roberts had actually written two Bronson films already, both westerns and both from very different phases of Charlie's career. But this was a story loosely based on the real life murders committed by a guy named Richard Speck, a sicko who killed eight nurses. What resulted is a film that not only fits into the cop sleaze movement, but as a side note, it also works as a hybrid of the cop film and the slasher film. 
See, the slasher genre was in full swing in the early 80s with movies like Friday the 13th and Prom Night. And The Killer of 10 to Midnight, he certainly fits. Stalking women, making creepy phone calls, slashing people with a knife, sometimes while they're fornicating in a van even. You don't get any more slasher than that. Now, J. Lee Thompson, by the time he directed 10 to Midnight, he was one of the regular directors Bronson worked with. But he was also perfect for another reason. He had already directed a movie about a psycho stalker in 1962's Cape Fear, the original version of that film. And what's crazy is that the endings of 10 to Midnight and Cape Fear, they're the same, except they're exact perfect negatives, perfect opposites of each other. And 10 to Midnight wasn't the only movie that tried to marry the cop and slasher genres. Chuck Norris played a sheriff taking on a superhuman serial slasher in a movie called Silent Rage from 1982. And what's crazy is how blatantly Silent Rage wears its hybrid intentions on its sleeve. The final shot of that movie, with a certain character springing from out of the water, that absolutely smacks of the final scare in Friday the 13th. But back to 10 to Midnight. It didn't just represent the new chapter of American cop films in the 80s. It also represented the new face of the Charles Bronson movie in the 80s, and the new face of Bronson, literally. Gone were the deep lines on Bronson's face, as some presumed plastic surgery gave him a new, puffier countenance around this time. Also gone, by and large, were the attempts at branching out to New Horizons, as Bronson had found his regular home for the decade at Canon Films, another mini-major, where he just cranked out action films. Right, as I said earlier, the cop sleaze film worked well at many major studios, and by the end of the decade, Bronson made another such film for Canon, Kinjite, Forbidden Subjects, in 1989. Now that film starts with a shot of a briefcase opening, revealing a leather whip and a jar of Vaseline. And yeah, we soon learn there's a dildo and rubber gloves in that briefcase too. And around the film's six minute mark, Bronson rogers a guy with that dildo. I mean, good grief. I'm guessing Bronson never touched so many sex toys in his life as when he made movies for canon. Now, in Bronson's post-canon career, the actor made a 1993 TV movie called Donato and Daughter. And interestingly, it basically reworked two scenes from 10 to Midnight, since it was also about cops chasing a serial killer creep. Now that brings us to the fourth film, 1984's Tightrope, which gave Clint Eastwood what is probably the most anti-heroic cop character of his career. Clint's character is chasing a killer who is strangling sex workers in New Orleans' French Quarter. It was Clint who relocated the story as written from San Francisco to New Orleans. And that was probably a good call considering that the French Quarter is basically America's sex industry answer to Amsterdam's red light district. Clint, in fact, actually had a lot of control over that production, stepping in and ghost directing the movie. See the film's screenwriter, Richard Tuggle, he had negotiated to helm the movie too. He didn't quite work out, but he did contribute enough to retain the sole directing credit. But again, this is a very different and complex Clint Eastwood character. A uh, divorced cop, he's been tracking a serial killer whose kinks are uncomfortably close to his own. And when he has to interview sex workers in his pursuit of the killer, sometimes he gets offered sexual favors. He don't turn them down. See, this is a different, less heroic Clint Eastwood cop. And it doesn't stop there. In one love scene, he's covered head to toe in baby oil. Later, after meeting a male escort at a bar, he hints that he has had gay sex before. See, this is just a very different Clint Eastwood character. And sex, and sometimes violent sex, permeates almost every aspect of the cop's life. A normal family drive is interrupted when he has to explain to his daughter what a hard-on is. The woman he's dating, she runs a rape center, and she doesn't mind being kinky either. Even though this is a well-made picture by Warner Brothers, it's totally part of the early 80s cop sleaze movement. We encounter all sorts of kinkiness along the investigation, from hot oil wrestlers to women who get paid to be bullwhipped. And the shooting locations were so authentic that some of the crew were apparently afraid to touch anything at one of the locations for fear of contracting disease. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, weren't there some exceptions to the sleaze cop trend? Weren't there some classy prestige cop movies in the early 80s too? I'm sure there were. Just off the top of my head, there was Prince of the City from 1981, which was directed by Sidney Lumet, the guy who made Serpico in the previous decade. So what conclusions can I draw from the four films under examination? Well, here's something interesting. The first and the last films of this subgenre, Cruising and Tightrope, those two keep it a total mystery as to who the killer is for most of the film. And they were the two made by big studios. Now, the chronological middle two, Vice Squad and Ten to Midnight, they let the viewer know who the killer is the whole time, and those two films want you to see the awful acts. And those middle two, they were made by many majors. Now, what does that mean? Well, hell if I know, but it is a valid observation. Now, weren't there movies about vice cops in the 1970s? Well, yeah, there were, like Busting from 1974, but they weren't completely focused on sex. They also mixed in drugs and gambling, stuff like that. It was the 80s that made the cop film all sex all the time. At the beginning of 10 to Midnight, the killer flips a butterfly knife while wearing a members only jacket and listening to a rock song that sounds like it could have been recorded by Survivor. Is that the most 80s film moment ever? I'm not sure about that, but here's something sort of interesting. That song, called Look At Me, was performed by someone named Bruce Scott. Now, who was Bruce Scott? In addition to being a musician, he was also an actor. In fact, he played one of the two blonde kids that ended up getting hanged from the gallows after Marshall Clint Eastwood rounded them up as fugitives in the film Hang Em High. So just another interesting connection between the careers of those two action titans Eastwood and Bronson. Did I just blow your mind? Yeah, I just blew your mind. <laughs>